Hello everyone, I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange. Thank you so very much for joining us. Tonight we're going to talk about the federal government yanking the $800 million from the high-speed train away from Wisconsin. Scott Walker is calling it a victory. We'll also talk about the incoming governor's increasingly tough talk about how he's going to deal with the public employees' unions. We'll talk about the ongoing trouble at Milwaukee's Bradley Tech High School, and we will talk about this Catholic shrine near Green Bay where the church claims Mary, the mother of Jesus, actually made an appearance about 150 years ago. Joining us tonight, our newspaper columnist, Joel McNally. Longtime state Senate Republican aide and oftentimes a host over on WISN Radio, Kevin Fisher. Denise Calloway is the coordinator of business and community partnerships for the Milwaukee Public School System. And Gerard Randall, consultant and local job creation expert. Rick Horwitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, first let's talk about Scott Walker keeping his campaign promise, killing this proposed high-speed train between Milwaukee and Madison, and the Obama administration keeping its promise and yanking away the $800 million that was going to pay for it. Does Walker come across as a fiscally conservative hero, or does he come across, Denise, as a fool who let this money get away? Well, I think it kind of depends on where you stood on light rail. For those people who were opposed to, or to the, the rail system, for those people who were opposed to it, I mean, he did exactly what he promised to do. Um, for a lot of people, though, who saw this as an opportunity to bring jobs to the state, um, to have the state be part of this very much interconnected, intrastate um, system, you know, it, it's, it's a wasted opportunity. It's a lost opportunity for the state of Wisconsin. I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody that the federal government took the money. Um, the money was designated for rail and rail expansion, and we weren't interested in that, so the money went to those communities where it did. But, you know, even now we're hearing that there's other fallout beyond that in terms of some job loss that we're going to see. The train company that came here specifically to build trains has now said that 2012, it's out of here. Um, so, you know, it, it's an opportunity. I think it's really clear how I felt about this rail system and the opportunity it presented to the state. So I see it as a loss for the state, a loss opportunity to move into the future, to be part of this, this system that's going to be moving goods and um, ideas um, across the upper Midwest, and we're not part of it. And if, I, if I'm in Minnesota, I'm a little worried about the impact of what Wisconsin has done to the efforts that the Twin Cities and that Minnesota may have in terms of trying to be part of this system that's going to be moving ideas across the country. Kevin, he said from the beginning it was a goofy project, people weren't going to ride the train, and he wasn't going to take the money. Yeah, if you haven't uh, figured it out by now, when Scott Walker says something, that he's going to do something and makes a promise, he fulfills it. Uh, and it, you better get the message now that this guy means what he says. And he campaigned on it. The majority of voters in Wisconsin said, that's right, we don't want it. The Journal Sentinel editorial board, it probably pained them to write this this morning, but it even said, look, the support wasn't there. Uh, maybe one third of people support this, this project. And I, I, don't, I think it is a victory for the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, wasteful spending is wasteful spending, whether it's in Wisconsin, Idaho, Wyoming, California, Florida, wherever. And the Obama administration got it half right. Uh, they, they, they saw that, they were, uh, that there's a new sheriff in town and they were not going to beat their heads against the wall. But that money should have gone back to Washington and should have been, been put back in the Treasury to help with our massive deficit and debt. It, 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 the California is being praised as the winner in this? I don't think so. They've got a $45 billion rail project between Anaheim and San Francisco. $2.25 billion in stimulus money to pay for it. They don't know how they're going to get the rest. Uh, they don't have the money. Uh, they're, they're going to bond. They have the worst bonding uh, rating in the nation. It's going to be very difficult them to, for them to pay for this. And what they're going to get from Wisconsin is, is, is a drop in the bucket. So uh, th I think this is not all that bad news for Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, we, we get, we, the train manufacturer says they're leaving. Fine. If we're not going to build trains, it wouldn't make sense for them to be here. We lure other businesses here. And Scott Walker, uh, the people that voted for him on this platform are very, very happy with him. And I think this is just the beginning. What you see, what you hear from this guy is what you get. And in politics, that's very refreshing. What, what about the people who say you're kissing goodbye $800 million? You should have taken that and built whatever they wanted built. No, because there was a cost to that. 
And on the list of priorities, that was not the highest priority, not for this administration, certainly, uh, or the incoming administration. There won't be any read my lip moments for, uh, for the Scott Walker administration. And, and that is what people were expecting. If you tell them that this is what you're going to do and you lay out your reasons in a, a clear manner and you stick to those reasons, uh, people will support you. There wasn't a lot of support for this train. It was sold as high-speed rail. It wasn't high-speed. It wasn't going to be high-speed by any stretch of the imagination for better than 15 years, based on the projections that came out of the federal government. The, uh, the money that would have had to have been contributed by local communities that wanted stops or by the state overall in order to subsidize the cost of ridership would not have made that train a successful rider program. Those who still want pieces of that action, um, Minnesota was mentioned uh, by Denise, I think those communities are going to have to take another hard look at whether or not they too can afford, in an era when you have to set priorities on spending, um, whether or not they can afford to have uh, these kinds of rail systems, because I honestly don't believe they are going to live up to expectations for this. Any way he'll look like a hero in the uh, end? No, of course not. This is absurd. The, everything we just heard is absurd. Governors are supposed to get hundreds of millions of dollars for their state, not give it away to other states. Uh, $800, $800 million for jobs and development at a time when this this state desperately needs jobs and development to, to, to throw it away. There's a reason why California was called a winner, why New York was called a winner, why Illinois is called a winner, because Wisconsin is a loser. And now the people of Wisconsin are losers because they have a governor who, don't, who doesn't want to spend money to create jobs or have development. On the north side of Milwaukee? Are you kidding when you say, oh, well, we can just get some uh, some other company to move in there? The, the Talgo train company, which could have expanded as part of this national system to, to really create jobs, was the first major company to move onto the north side of Milwaukee in the black community where jobs are desperately needed in decades. And, and this governor doesn't care about that. This governor could care less about that, calls it a victory to shut down those people's jobs, to shut down $800 million worth of jobs and development. This is absurd. It doesn't make any sense from a conservative standpoint. The money that the state was going to have to spend was chicken feed, but it was going to get $800 million in development. That's what governors are supposed to do, not throw it away. Hey, as long as we're talking about Scott Walker, let's talk about his and the Republicans' increasingly tough talk when it comes to how they're going to deal with the public employee unions. It's gone from layoffs and more furlough days to higher pension and health insurance payments, and then it went to possibly decertifying the union. One lawmaker is now saying maybe we should just make this a right-to-work state where you don't even have to join the union if you work in a union shop. If you don't feel like it, don't join it. Makes you wonder if there's uh, maybe more confrontation on the horizon. Well, on all of those ideas that have been thrown out, I don't think that they would have been thrown out with the kind of certainty uh, certainly not without the kind of passion that they've been thrown out there with if you didn't have uh, Republicans in control in the legislature as well as in control in the governor's uh, seat. So you have these ideas that have been tossed out um, from time to time and certainly there are some advantages to being a right, a right to work state. The advantages are we look more Low like wages. some of the, Well, lower wages and lower benefits but some of these things that we're currently paying for are unsustainable. So where would you rather fall? Having more jobs that are competitive with those states that are attracting jobs or having fewer jobs because we pay wages that cannot be sustained by the businesses that we want to grow here uh, or relocate here. It's not going to happen under the scenario that we currently have. And certainly other states that have right to work laws have proven that they can attract and grow businesses in those communities and that those workers have family sustaining wages at the same time. Do you worry that there will be uh, 
more severe labor unrest than we've seen in a long time? I, I, I worry about everything. Uh, right after the election, I, I wrote a column saying the worst thing isn't that Scott Walker got elected governor, but that both houses of the legislature are now controlled by Republicans. There's going to be absolutely no check on the governor, and the governor is not going to check any goofy idea that comes out of the Republican legislature. Uh, the things that Kevin talks about every week could now become law. Uh, How about that? And, and won't that be terrific? I mean, won't that be a great state what the to live in? Of Wisconsin uh, the fact of the matter is, when you start talking about gutting the wages of, of public employees, uh, banning their unions, shutting down their unions, uh, getting rid of all their benefits, uh, public employees, just like private employees, are taxpayers in this state. And if their wages get gutted, if they get laid off, if they shut, if their jobs are shut down, that means revenue which is not coming into the state to run this state. That means that that's why we're in this horrible economic situation right now. Nobody's making any money. There are too many people out of work. There are too many people who aren't making any money. And now you want to gut. The, the public employee unions as well. It's going to be ugly, it really is, for at least the next two years and maybe for the next four years because this Republican legislature can do the most extreme things it wants and they're not going to be pretty. Denise, what Walker said during the campaign so many times is the day will be over as soon as he takes governor, uh, the governor's job where public employees are untouchable. He said that day is going to be over, and we're going to get there. They're going to get their uh, health benefits and wages and pension contributions in line with private employees. Well, I, I know that's what he said, and I think clearly there is the appetite for people to to hear that and to want to have that happen. You know, the issue is that in many cases, public employees made concessions as part of the bargaining um, process, where they took wages that were lower to have higher benefits. They, you know, so that was the trade-off that they made. So it's not as if these benefits simply ballooned um, to the point where some people feel that they're um, um, not in line with what's happening in the private sector on their own. This was done as part of a strategy to say we are willing to give this in order to get that. So, so now what's happening is that the bargaining that people did in good faith is now has the potential of not being realized if there are these changes to come in and kind of force some of these issues. I always believe that there's always an opportunity and room for compromise, but you, you have to come into the situation saying, you know, this is what we're going to have to do. There's some tough situations that we need to, to, to address. How are we going to do that together? As opposed to saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to impose this. That's where you run the risk, I think, of having labor unrest. Um, so a good I, union I, helps management. I, I, I agree, and I, and I think that there hasn't been that opportunity for there to be that kind of a discussion. Gentlemen, at the governor's conference, the Republican governor's conference a few weeks ago, uh, the New Jersey governor, who's hated by the Democrats, he stood up and he told these new governors, listen, the first thing you have to do is take on your public employees unions, because if you're going to take care of the budget problems in your states, that's where you have to start. And, he, and he's right. And uh, uh, the, the public sector and public unions are killing budgets in cities, counties, villages, towns, all across the state. Now let's not jump to conclusions here, and not, let's not engage in hyperbole. Uh, Governor-elect <laughs> Walker said this week that he's not really sold on the idea of making Wisconsin a right-to-work state. Others have said this week that decertifying unions, while it might be an enticing concept, uh, might be difficult to pull off. The new governor has taken, I think, the very reasonable approach that you do have to bring public, public sector benefits and pay into line with the private sector. An acquaintance of mine emailed me this week, and he's right on the money. He said, why should the public sector get better salaries, pensions, medical benefits, dental, sick leave, vacation, than the people who are paying for all that, the taxpayer? It's a very legitimate question. And I don't think there's anything wrong with bringing the public sector in line with the private sector. The public sector has had it pretty good for a long, long time. Well, we're broke. The gravy train is over. Something's got to be done because we can't afford all these lavish salaries and benefits anymore. All right, let's move on to the next topic. More problems this week after at another fight at Bradley Tech High School in Milwaukee. Why is the district unable to maintain order at that place? 
parents have to be afraid to, to send their kids to school in the morning. Oh, okay, okay. Let, let, let's talk about what's happening <laughs> Wait, at, who, at Bradley who works Town. At I, I do. I work at MPS. <laughs> you look at it's pretty and have obvious. Denise's mouth open. <laughs> well, you know, because it, it's not a matter of the school not uh, of parents having to be afraid to send their children to school. Yes, there have been these incidents at Bradley Tech, but they've involved a small number of kids when you take a look at the entire student population. There were an, most of the kids wow, in that what school. Wow, what is this? Excuse me. 28 squad Kevin, cars? You know, Kevin, I thought we'd get a little bit further before the, the lady at church well, my was going to have to interrupt you again. It's not a matter of spin. It's a matter of fact. And I know sometimes for you that gets a little fuzzy. Fact but is let me go back to what's actually there. happening in the school. And this is a dialogue program, not a monologue program. No, but I, I think uh, as a respectful program, we like to have people be able to get more than two sentences out of their mouth. I'll so remember let me go, you said Let me go that. back to the facts, Kevin. So you might want to listen to this part. <laughs> what, what's happened at Bradley Tech is that you're talking about a small number of kids who are engaged in these issues. The reason that you have large numbers of police there is because these issues don't suddenly pop up in the school. These are issues that are happening in the community that come into the school. So what the district has done to be very responsible is to have police officers placed in that building to work cooperatively with the police and other neighborhood organizations to be able to try to get a handle on these things as they happen. And the police department has responded absolutely the right way to come in with a number of officers to be able to control the situation and get that situation taken care of. Parents don't need to be afraid to send their kids to Bradley Tech. Parents are not afraid to send their kids to Bradley Tech. What this is is an issue that the school and the community and the police department need to work on together because this is not an issue that starts in the school. It's an issue that starts outside in the community and that the school has to come in and work to find a way to handle. But why does it happen at Bradley Tech over and over again? Well, mm. uh, part of what needs to uh, be realized also is that superintendent did come up with um, a game plan as to how they're going to address those problems going forward. And, and it'll probably serve as a model just as Bradley Tech served as a model for some of the other issues that cropped up in the past, uh, particularly at sporting events, uh, by having additional police officers and engaging the community and dealing with the problems. Uh, Bradley Tech will again serve as a model. One of the things that he said that I thought absolutely made sense is we want to make sure that the kids who go to Bradley Tech are kids that can uh, perform academically and kids who want to be there for those programs. MPS has an obligation to educate every child, but every child doesn't need to be educated at Bradley Tech. And I think that's part of the issue. When you have, as Denise pointed out, a small group of young folk who may not be the best fit for Bradley Tech and have expressed it uh, by not being cooperative, at the very least when it comes to some of their behavior, then they shouldn't be there. They need to get out. The community has demonstrated that it's willing to be supportive. Lyle Balistrieri, in fact, the, the chair of the Bradley Tech Commission, has also said he thinks that some of the problems that have been expressed there have been problems that from time to time crop up, get overblown, get a, an extreme response, and then... Overblown? The, the, oh, well, I'm sorry, I should I, interrupt. I said some of the things have been overblown and they get an extreme response and then the response sometimes is not helpful. In this particular situation, when it came out, I think the community did the right thing. They engaged MPS, they engaged those parents that were willing to be engaged, and they're going to come up with a plan that will get those kids out of there that don't belong there. Kevin, uh, a big problem MPS has had for years is that it hasn't been able to attract a lot of Milwaukee's uh, parents because they don't want to send their kids to an MPS school because they cannot guarantee their children a sense of safety. So, so how does Bradley Tech counter that? I was in Bradley Tech this week and uh, I'm there often uh, during this time of year working at their basketball games and I know security people there, I know teachers there, I know former teachers there. It has just deteriorated from, deteriorated from one of the prime best high schools in Milwaukee to one of the worst. You've got bad kids in there. You have a school system that is in denial, does not want to recognize or admit there's a problem. They tried to sweep this under the rug and keep it from, from the public and, and, and from the uh, Milwaukee media. Its story didn't come out for o over a week. Uh, they're trying to poo-poo this now. And uh, I think the major problem at Bradley Tech, uh, besides the fact that you have bad kids and obviously parents <laughs> who don't care, 
uh, is that just the whole open air concept of that building where every kid can see what every other kid is doing and it just it just opens itself up to disruption that fights erupt more easily that uh, they get out of control kids you take their cell phones they call other uh, kids or other adults they show up with weapons and uh, we're supposed to just you know call this an isolated incident and it's nothing to worry about and you shouldn't be afraid to send your kids to, to Bradley Tech. Well, that's nonsense. No other high school in the, in the state has 28 squad cars show up at the end of a school day. And this happens more often than, than uh, is, is, is being reported. I say get those kids out that don't want to uh, uh, be there. Uh, there was a, a proposal in the 80s to build a disruptive school, maybe two, maybe three. MPS has lots of empty buildings they're not using. Take those kids who don't want to learn, separate them from the kids that do want to learn, and you might not have this happening all the time. I guarantee, though, there's not one private school in this community that has not had a fight so far. That's this not year. the point. Not one school. That and is so the point. It is a point. That is it's the point. Not... And, and so it's not unusual. But I bet there isn't one other school that had a fight where 23 squad cars pulled up. That, that may have been the situation, but it has this situation is also being has, reacted to Bradley Tech. It's being yeah, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, oh, there's, there's a fight and there's 28 squared cars that appear and that's terrible. Uh, but terrible. then say but then say the district is not being responsive. Part of the reason again that you have that kind of a response is because of the issues that exist in the community that the police department knows about, that the district knows about and that we are working hard to address. You know, so so don't say it's trying to be swept under the rug and it's not responsive. There is a response and it it is being addressed. Is it happening as quickly as everybody would like to see it have ha happen? No, but efforts are being taken, and Gerard's right. There are steps that are going to be made and that will be announced to talk about how this is going to be addressed. How about right, we placing, gotta, we gotta how go about placing next... blame and not being in denial and getting our heads out of the sand about Nobody's this? Nobody's heads just, in the sand. Get, Touching on the next realistic. topic just for a minute. Let's talk for just a minute about the Catholic bishop in Green Bay this week giving the seal of approval to the belief that Mary, the mother of Jesus, actually appeared in a vision to a young woman there 150 years ago. This would make it the only place this has ever happened in the United States and puts the site in sort of the same league as destinations like Fatima in Portugal or Lourdes in France with all of the problems the church has right now. Why in the world would they even give any attention to something like this? Because well, it's a feel-good story, and I don't see any controversy here. And uh, <laughs> you know, there have it's been. It's not controversial. I just think it's odd. <laughs> yeah, what's odd about it? I mean, people see visions of ghosts and, and Loch Ness monsters. People can't see the Virgin Mary. I mean, this has been documented. They've gone through all the hoops. It's been documented. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and and the Catholic. She was actually there. The That's been documented. The Catholic Church oh. is based on faith. Right. And, mm -hmm. and the Catholic Church canonizes people as saints that have been dead for centuries. I, I, I can't believe, well, apparently, I, I guess, from the chuckles and sneers already, uh, that we're, we're going to have some Catholic bashing before the show is over. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to Catholic bash, but I want to say this. This is an example of where this church is. Uh, this is an example of the priest uh, that this extremely right-wing pope is putting in place, the people he's elevating to bishop, uh, that, you know, uh, 150 years ago, uh, someone out in the middle of uh, the woods thought they saw something, and now this bishop is saying that is worthy of belief. Well, he's no better at deciding what's worthy of belief than I am, and I, I'm worthy of not believing it. Uh, and uh, and it, it is absurd to me with everything that's going on in the church today uh, that this is even a subject. You know, well, I, I, I didn't bring I, I, it up. Now, now, back to Washington for just a minute. <laughs> if a compromise is when both sides give up something to reach a deal, why are Republicans the only ones acting victorious about this week's big tax cut agreement? Could it be because the Democrats are at a loss for words? Here's Rick Horowitz. Okay, help me out here. Aren't the Democrats the ones who are tight with Hollywood, with most of the big players in the movie and TV industries? And trial lawyers, aren't the Dems tight with the trial lawyers too? And they still can't figure out how to tell a good story or write effective dialogue or frame an argument? Amazing. Depressing. Some liberals are really upset with President Obama this week for the tax cut deal he made with the Republicans. The Republicans were playing hardball, and they could afford to because they'd already won the argument. Taxes are bad. Lower taxes are good. End of story. 
The president says the public is on his side in the various policy debates that have been bubbling up lately. And he's right, according to the polls, but not according to the politics, which is why Obama still had to give ground. According to the politics, the Republicans don't pay any price for taking unpopular positions. Democrats simply haven't made the case in a way that makes Republicans pay a price. So Republicans can say no tax cuts for anybody, not even the people who could really use them, unless the wealthiest people get tax cuts too, and they get away with it. They can say, unless we get the tax deal we want, we won't even discuss any other legislation, and they get away with it. They can say, you've got 57 votes to end, don't ask, don't tell, and we've got 43 to keep it. We win, and they get away with it. These shouldn't be hard arguments for the Democrats to win. That's my point. Over here, you've got the soup kitchens, and over here, you've got the super rich. Who needs the help more? Over here, the unemployed. Over here, the uh, unashamed. Are these guys really going to hold those guys hostage until these guys get an even bigger share of the pie? Over here, you've got 57 senators, and over here, you've got 43. Whatever happened to, we deserve an up or down vote. No procedural gimmicks, an up or down vote. That's what Republicans used to scream, and they'd make Democrats squirm. But now, the other way around, not even close. Hey, Democrats, call a scriptwriter, call a lawyer, something. Get out your message or get out of the way. Well, thanks, Rick, and thank you so much for watching. Stay warm. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.